take that as you can hear us. Okay, good. Thank you, Susan. Um, a couple things before we get started and I introduce Dr. Carson is um, as we're going through this presentation, I will tell you this was a very um, high registered webinar, so no pressure on your, on your part, um, Dr. Carson, but I know that there's a lot of people who have a lot of questions. And so um, if you can throughout the webinar, if you want to either put questions in the chat box or you can put it in the Q&A box, we will do our best to get to what we can get to tonight and what we don't get to, I will follow up with Dr. Carson to see if we can get answers and get that out to everybody. Um, but I know um, this is a, a topic that is near and dear to a lot of people who are on this call tonight because it's something that they struggle with with their loved one with Angelman syndrome. So we are incredibly thankful that we were able to fund this project with you, Dr. Carson, and, and the work that you're doing. And thank you for taking time to come on tonight and give us a little bit of a, an update of where you are and what you still need. Because you know, I know that it's possible you still need things from the community to be able to really address the, the situation. So um, I'm gonna pass it on to you. For those of you that do not know Dr. Carson, he is one of our amazing clinicians at the Angelman Syndrome Clinic in Vanderbilt. He's been with us for um, a lot of years. I don't, even know, I don't even know how many years, Dr. Carson, but I know you've been around since I've been here. So actually only 2018, so I'm, I'm relatively a newcomer compared to some of the, the others in the group. So. Well, that we're both newcomers because I came in 2019, so we'll just, we're in this together. But I also um, just want to thank you and, and, reach, and make sure people know that Dr. Carson is actually one of our clinicians at the Angelman Clinic. So if it's something you're interested in go, coming and going to see him at his clinic, please let me know and I can make sure to get, in, get you in contact so we can um, get you seen by this amazing human being who's been working really hard for the past year with amazing support from the Angelman Syndrome Foundation, but more importantly, some support from amazing families and donors that were able and really passionate about this project. So I'm gonna stop talking because no one wants to hear from me. And I'm gonna stop, I'll stop sharing my screen to Dr. Carson. I'm just gonna pass it on to you um, and we can get started. Okay. This is always the part where I um, try not to embarrass myself. It's I'm okay, I'm here to help the, just in case. <laughs> the Zoom to make sure things um, go the way they're supposed to. Um, Let's see. Apologize. You're yeah. fine. I need the big fancy screen here. Let's try that one. Perfect. Something's happening. And oh, there you go. You're good. Does that look big now? All screen encompassing? Yep, that's perfect. Excellent. So, all right, well, um, you know, any get, you get bonus if you guess what this picture is. Um, I know some people have figured it out before, but um, I like fun pictures. But um, thank you all for joining. Um, as Amanda has realized, it doesn't take much to get me to to talk about this topic because it's kind of what I like to do. Um, and I think it, you know the biggest thank you really goes out to really most of you that are on this call because I am learning from you guys, and my hope is that I can use the the collective wisdom of the community in a way of crowdsourcing research. Research. Um, how do we learn from the acquired wisdom along the way to help both understand what works and what doesn't work? And so that's kind of the the approach I've taken. Um, you know, obviously I'm very interested in the whole process of developing um, new treatments and that's key for the future. Um, but I also like the idea of thinking hard about what treatments are already here that we need to think about using because if it's FDA approved and safe, I can start someone on it tomorrow. And so we want, it's, it's that combination of of how do we think creatively about what, what tools we already have. So as this community knows, there's a lot of abnormal movements that go along with Angelman syndrome. Um, some of the, the simplest and most benign are what we call stereotypy. So that's the fancy name for stereotypical movements. So that can be things as, you know, a happy dance or, or lots of different things that, you know, it's like that looks kind of funny, but it's not a problem, it's not bad. Um, tremors and tremulousness, of course, seizures, we won't talk as much about today. Um, 
ataxia, and then what I'm going to try to focus most on is is non-epileptic myoclonus. Yeah, sorry, moving buttons. So, um, non-epileptic myoclonus really has is best described by the work from Ron Thiebert in Boston, and um, we're talking about intermittent myoclonic-like movements. Um, these often don't, well, they don't by their nature show up on EEG um, because of things that show up on an EEG are coming from the outer part of the brain called the cortex. So if it's from a deeper structure, it, we would say it's not epileptogenic. Um, it's often mostly described as being in the hands. Um, these can last from seconds to hours. Um, as children get older, it's really more a disease of the, the teenage year or a symptom of the teenage years and adulthood. Um, but it's really quite common. And again, what's been described is benzodiazepines are often the most helpful. Um, Levetiracetam or Keppra can be helpful for some. Um, and valproic acid, which is a commonly used seizure medicine um, in children for myoclonus, is not overly helpful and doesn't, isn't always well tolerated in um, children and adults with Angelman syndrome. <coughs> so, um, I just want to show a couple of examples. Um, hopefully, here we go. I'm just going to mute this. So this is a young woman who, um, and this we'll talk about more, but I see this and I would call this non-epileptic myoclonus. Um, it's one of the challenges of that that's going to be important in the future is what do we call different movements? Um, you know, and here's another example, and I'm playing them both at the same time. But you can, I think what's clear to see is really the similarities between two separate individuals that have these very similar movements. So, um, again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, these are just some quotes from people who have submitted data for our, our um, online project and just describing what happens during these events. Um, she can't or won't walk because she is in fear of falling, um, cannot participate in daily living, and it causes stress because he can't do much. He breasts hold and he'll clusters for hours so he's cranky and exhausted. So again, I think these are all different examples that I think all of you probably know and, and understand better than I do. So um, this is an example I use just to demonstrate that, you know, we really try hard, but sometimes this can be really hard to treat. So this was, um, you know, one of the patients in the survey who um, is now 31. And this, these are almost every day. They last from one to six hours. Um, sometimes it's so severe, he sweats and appears in pain. Um, he's currently on... Again, if I count one, two, three, four, five, seven medicines, really for a mix of some of the other Angelman symptoms, including sleep and constipation, but at least three to four medicines specifically to try to treat the myoclonus. Um, and if you look at the prior med list, again, it's not like people haven't really been trying hard. So lots of different things have been tried and some make things worse, some just otherwise didn't help. So when when I learned about this, and really it came from having patients who were like, I don't know what else to do. Um, so of course, we always start with going to the literature. Um, and so this is just an example. If, if you go to PubMed, which is the kind of the repository for the medical literature, if you look at Angelman syndrome and epilepsy, lots of papers, over 300. Angelman in speech, so communication, over 200. Sleep, not as many. Gay. Again, some of the other kind of list of the major challenges in Angelman syndrome, we get to non-epileptic myoclonus and there were four papers. So this just points out there's a lot we need to learn and, and try to better understand. Um, so one of the things that I think is suggested at least early on from the data we've been collecting is this concept of what's called dystonia. Um, and dystonia is a, is a different type of, of it falls into the category of movement disorders, but in a way, uh, 
there's not an easy way to think about it or describe it, but it's almost cramp-like movements. And sometimes it will be that, that if you think about muscles that make, say, your fingers flex versus extend, you can get kind of both those muscle groups are activating at the same time. So you can get these kind of weird, funny hand positions. Um, and there's different types of dystonias. Um, that's just kind of one example. And, and why I've been thinking about this more is one of the videos I was reviewing with one of my movement disorders friends, and she's like, that looks like dystonia. Um, and so where this gets important is when we think about different movement disorders, we can start to steal from what has been learned about different types of movements. Um, and so for example, uh, and I'm gonna use a, a lot of different neurotransmitter words, all of it, will come together in the end. So don't try to take too many notes or anything. Well, well hopefully I can make it make sense. But the, the point is there's different chemicals in the brain that control how we make movements and where whether we have abnormal movements. Um, and that for dystonia, some of the thought is that there's a hyperactivation, so too much dopamine, one neurotransmitter, and that it results in um, too much activation of um, a certain type of receptor called a muscarinic receptor. And that is a, a target of another neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And I promise I'll come back to this and, and why I'm even bringing it up will hopefully make sense by the time I've done. Um, I love this kind of picture because this is demonstrating the interactions between the outer part of the brain to the deeper structures of the brain, including the cerebellum, the things that control motor movement. And there's plus arrows and there's minus arrows and lots of different things. And it's overly complicated. And it's like looking at the Tokyo subway map. So um, I like this one better because it just demonstrates that within the, the brain, the part of the brain that controls movement, that there's, there's two different pathways that are at times um, opposing each other. And if there's a mismatch between those, people can get what's called chorea, so kind of like writhing movements. Um, if they're kind of opposing each other in the other direction, you can get Sy symptoms like somebody with Parkinson's disease would have and tremor and slowed movements. But if in a way they're both hyperactive, you can get dystonic movements. So it kind of, again, helps suggest uh, pathways of like how this stuff works. Um, lots of basic science has been done, which is again, very helpful in the way we think about things. And so in this area of the brain called the striatum that's really involved in things like movement disorders, dopamine, serotonin, again, neurotransmitters you may have heard of, as well as so cholinergic acetylcholine are all working in the same area and have differing roles. And so some of what we think about is how do these all merge together? We know a lot from um, we have friends, and I used to do this too, of people that study Angelman syndrome mice. Um, and this has been a very helpful tool to understand a, a lot of things. And it, including, we know that there's, there's altered levels of some of these same neurotransmitters we've been discussing, such as serotonin and dopamine, including changes in this pertinent area of the brain called the striatum. Um, UB3A, the key protein that is disrupted in Angelman syndrome, we know plays a role in both er in areas of the brain that involve coordination. So the striatum, what we've been talking about, as well as the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is the part of the brain that also helps with coordination. So the part that I know this has never happened to anyone on this call, but but if you hear stories of someone who drank too much alcohol and have kind of trouble walking, that's because it's affecting the cerebellum. Um, so again, there's lots of data that suggests even in the mouse model, there's disruption of these important pathways. So one reason I got, we were thinking about this a few years ago is of course, what I'm learning from you guys and learning from my patients. And um, we had a child who had really some 
at a young age had really severe myoclonus and just trying to figure out how to treat it, um, came across this uh, paper back in 2003 um, where they used this old medication called Reserpine. I don't know of anyone practicing today who's actually used this medicine, um, but I think it was instructive because it's a medicine that, that depletes both the brain and the peripheral nervous system of some of the compounds like dopamine and, and well, norepinephrine, which controls blood pressure and serotonin. So for somebody that had something that to me sounded like very much like non-epileptic myoclonus, this very old medicine helped. And so it then just kind of stirs up that idea of, okay, well, it helped. Why did it help? And is there, what does that help teach us about how we might consider treating this in the future? So the way I approach this, and of course, when this started, this was still in the heart of the COVID era, which hopefully someday we will move out of. Um, and it's, it was based on a lot of the, the kind of the approach to um, a lot of movement disorders, which is let's look at videos um, because there's lots of things that are just hard for us to put into words and hard for us to describe. And so the, really the components of this are to you know, get information about specific movements. And again, this is hopefully what those of you that have done the survey data, you know, we, we hopefully have collected data on what the movements are, what do they look like, what we should call them, and what medicines work, what medicines don't, what other interventions work, what, what make things worse. And then as part of this, we're hoping to collect a lot of videos. So we can, as an Angerman community, as in work with um, my movement disorder specialist friends and help say, this video represents this. And so that's kind of the part two of the project, which, which is not underway yet, but is you know hopefully coming soon. So kind of just to update on what, kind of we've learned so far. And I think the first thing that became very clear as looking at a lot of this data is we need to figure out what we're calling what. And, and by that, some of the things I listed is kind of the more common words we might use. So does this movement look like a jerk? Is it a spasm, a cramp, myoclonus tremor, or and then the ubiquitous other? And I, I think for some of these, the fact that we have, um, you know, and this is percent that then, you know, if say the family saying, oh, I call this a jerk. Well, MDs that have looked at it, 71% said, oh, what you're describing is myoclonus. 14% said tremor, some said seizure. And so just the point is, this is kind of spread across the board with different names. And a lot of what has been described in this column all sounds, in many cases, sounds very similar to something else in that same column. So this has really reinforced, and this is something that was discussed at the, the recent Angelman meeting, is, is thinking about how we will use videos to make a library. And for things that say that we don't have good examples of, do we need to you know, hire an actor to demonstrate something for us? So we can have a functional video library that is available to clinicians and is available, more importantly, I think, to those doing clinical trials so we can be on the same page and know what we're talking about. Because um, again, that's going to be key for developing new therapies. Um, demographics pages historically are, in my opinion, the most boring part of any discussion. Um, but I think what is, to me, was interesting is when we look at all kind of the different movements on the bottom, um, a lot of these kind of things that I think are more in the, what I would consider movement disorders are things that are starting in the teenage years where, in, and we don't have as many that reported seizures, but the average age of onset of seizures is, you know, less than a year and a half old. So. Um, I do think that reinforces that we're definitely talking about two distinct entities, if, if not more. Um, the characteristics, um, 
again, this is data that, that yeah, I don't know if it helps us at this point, but it's good to have, uh, you know, when we talk about these different movements of where do they happen? And mostly hands and arms involves the legs, sometimes the face, and then we have some other kind of body parts. Um, to me, what I think was very interesting when we talk about level of awareness is, you know, by their nature, movement disorders don't tend to cause loss of awareness, whereas seizures often can. And so no matter what these different movements were called, you know, tremor, or even myoclonus, pretty much everybody was still awake and alert, or they, they may respond, but it was just slow. Versus in those describing seizures, you know, over half were non-responsive during a seizure event. So again, I think this is just one more example that kind of, you know, it's not dramatic finding, but it does help us kind of separate things into, you know, categories a little better. Um, I also was trying to get a sense of um, how frequent these events were. And again, the numbers are all across the board um, where some people have events with a frequency of they can't go much more than an hour with having them. And some, they may go greater than a month without having an event. So obviously our goal is to take all of these and push them out to here so we're you know, the frequency of events is less than once a month with the goal of never. Um, duration, again, often is quite variable. Um, I think the thing that, that jumped out to me is, again, bringing in the seizure component. Um, almost all the seizures, thankfully, were less than a minute, where a lot of the more movement disorders you know, especially with, with what we're calling myoclonus or described as myoclonus or tremor may last for hours to even almost all day. So again, these are the things that we hope to figure out how to make go away. And of course, as an epileptologist, I still don't like seizures, but um, that, that's a discussion for another day. So, um, we also wanted to get a sense of triggers. And uh, I think at this point, this, in my opinion, may be the single most important slide that it, in my mind so far. Um, so essentially what we're looking at is this is percent of, and, and what I did is because there's kind of similarity between movements, I just clumped everything that was in this movement disorders category. So I took out seizures and then just combined everything else to just kind of get an across the board look. Um, you know, these numbers kind of may be artificially inflated because if somebody said they have tremors and myoclonus, then they may be in here twice, but kind of as an early first look, um, I think this is, it was somewhat instructive. So obviously repeating what Dr. Thieber's group demonstrated that as people get older, things get worse. Um, Activity can be a trigger. Um, as we go on, rest tends to help. Um, sleep tends to be very helpful, which is very common with movement disorders. The definitive way to fix one is to go to sleep. But when we look at things that made it much worse, um, so standing is a trigger, which I think is interesting. Constipation, um, much worse. So 70% of the time it makes things worse. Um, and for women, in 60% of people, they report that the hormonal changes with a period can make things worse. So to me, this at least thinking about constipation, which of course we want to treat, and we know it's a challenge to treat, but I think it reinforces that focusing on a single symptom like constipation can make other things better. Um, I've argued for a long time with a lot of patients, including those with things like cerebral palsy, that constipation makes seizures worse. So I think it's something about just the stress on the body um, can, again, make things worse. Um, we know with seizures that hormonal changes with periods in women can um, cause um, hormone imbalance, relative imbalances, which makes it easier to have seizures. How this fits in with the myoclonus, I don't know if I have a good answer for. 
but it is just another symptom that we can think about treating. Um, obviously, if it helps seizures, if it might help myoclonus, um, you know, for a lot of our young women, the hygiene challenges are clear and just kind of the, the, the stresses going on with, I don't understand what's going on here, um, you know, are other reasons that we often use, um, you know, oral contraceptive therapies. So this may be another um, consideration to kind of file away. Um, I threw in this one because it's um, seizure treatments. Again, so far there hasn't been a lot of seizure data. So I don't really necessarily find this at this point all that instructive, um, but definitely our kind of our benzodiazepines are high on the list of things that, that help for seizures. Um, one person said lamotrigine made things worse. Again, I don't think this is definitive data to say let's never use lamotrigine or avoid it, but it, it definitely supports, you know, reiterates why that we use a lot of benzodiazepines. Um, now, this is, sorry, the top, well, it's maybe not cut off for you, it's cut off for me, but again, this was the same approach where I, I clumped all the movement, the movement disorders together to help get a better sense of what medicines have been used, what helps and what doesn't help. Um, and again, this is now for movement disorders. So uh, again, I won't go through these individually but just focus on the better to much better section. Um, one thing that definitely jumps out is we see a lot of the benzodiazepines. So things, you know, almost some of the only things in the much better category are clobazam, which is on fee, clonazepam, which we use all the time. Here's lorazepam or Ativan. Um, again, some Depakote listed. Again, we're not as big fans at this point. And then diazepam. Um, diet therapies um, can be helpful. Again, we know they're challenging. Um, the one kind of outlier in this, in, and this is kind of what I, I set up this discussion for, is a medicine called trihexyphenidol. So this is um, goes by the name Artane. And so this kind of caught my attention because, again, it's, it's only six reporting. And again, some of these could be duplicates based on the way I did the data. But um, it suggested that this might be something that helps. Um, so what is it? So I say Artane because trihexyphenidyl is hard to say. But this is a drug that's commonly used by our movement disorder friends to treat dystonias. So some of these kind of cramp-like movements we discussed earlier. Um, and again, it gets into this mechanism where the idea in the striatum that that the alterations in dopamine lead to too much acetylcholine in that area of the brain. And this is a drug that blocks the effects of acetylcholine. Um, it's been around forever. It was originally studied in, you know, soon after World War II as a medicine to treat Parkinson's disease. So it's, it's not something new. Um, Again, this is just a list of what it's used for historically. So treating dystonia in children, it's used to treat Parkinson's disease, and then some of the other abnormal motor movements associated with Parkinson's disease. Of course, everything has its baggage. And I think one of the concerns I've had with, with Artane um, is, that the, is that acetylcholine is the same neurotransmitter that does a lot of other things. Um, and including control of bowel movement. So it could potentially worsen constipation. And so for a population who already has challenges with constipation and for whom constipation could make abnormal movements worse, I don't want to make things worse. Um, urinary retention is another concern. Um, and that's why I, I list all the potential symptoms of that. Um, and then, you know, some of the other symptoms are, are more rare. Some are good. So, um, um, xerostomia, I, gotta, I forget some of the, the fancy medical jargon, but um, basically it means de decreasing the amount of um, saliva production. So drooling. Drooling is a problem in Angelman syndrome for many of our kids. And this medicine, if nothing else, it helps for drooling. So, um, you know, there are some other benefits to it. 
you know, things that may be helpful in addition to potentially helping movements. Um, but again, it does come with some baggage and, and potential side effects that could be could be enough to say, okay, we, we can't use this. And there is a basis for this. So again, this is a kind of reiterate this whole, this is another cartoon of the striatum. And it really just points out this idea that you have these cells in the brain that are releasing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and a medicine like trihexyphenidyl is gonna help prevent some of the action in that part of the brain. Um, again, noting that there's also uh, lots of other players in this part of the brain. So, um, you know, there's more things to think about. So, again, we're still, I, I wish I could say we are solidly in the realm of having lots of data, but we're still kind of working on some anecdotes. And, um, you know, obviously I would love to say I have the magic bullet and everybody should be on it and this is going to fix everything. Um, I don't have that. Um, you know, some of what got this started is is one patient who has been on this for a couple of years and the bigger spells have gone away and still has some short ones, but they tend to be less than 20 seconds. So that reiterated, huh, This we, we need to think harder about this. Um, one of my kiddos here, um, when she started it, mom was like, this is amazing. Um, there's no more tremors and she's the most regular she's ever been, which of course I ask a lot about because I'm worried about making things worse. Um, that was kind of a honeymoon period. The kind of the, the bowel regularity did not continue, um, but overall things are still better. Um, one other example was actually, it seemed like it was helping and there's some concern that because they were using so much less Ativan that we have maybe started to have some withdrawal. Um, again, still kind of a work in progress and the verdict is still out. Um, another example of someone that was up to four milligrams three times a day and it really didn't seem to help at all. Um, another one of my kiddos, um, you know, was younger, um, I kind of worked her up a little more aggressively, really no benefit, and we've come back off. And then this is not an Artane example, but this is a, an example where someone was having, you know, switched around their ho hormone therapy and things got a whole lot better. So kind of going back to that hormone contribution. Um, and again, here's just another example of someone where you know they tried different medicines, they were considering getting a vagus nerve stimulator. And then they eventually gave a trial of, of trioxyphenidyl, doing great, almost tremor-free. Did have some mood changes that we're still not entirely sure if this was due to the medication um, and had a lot more crying. Um, so did have an addition of an SSRI Lexapro to help on that. So um, again, it's still a, a work in progress. Um, so when we think about what our next steps are, obviously from a research side, still collecting data, um, the, the trihexyphenidyl, my current kind of working thought is um, when we think hard about risk and benefits, um, if we consider this very carefully and monitor closely, I think it's a reasonable option that again is a medicine that's been around for a long time, especially a lot of our adult neurologists, if they treat movement disorders, this is something that they probably have a ton of experience with, a lot more than I do as a pediatric epileptologist. Um, but again, I think so far what I've learned is it's not the magic bullet. Um, there are other drugs being developed for other purposes that may target different areas of these transmitter pathways. Um, so there's definitely other options that are things that will be important to think about down the road. Um, I think a lot about a drug called tetrabenazine. Um, it's similar to the drug we talked about earlier um, called reserpine. Um, this is a medicine that's also used to treat dystonia. There's been some clinical trials of newer versions recently for um, some of the abnormal movements in Tourette syndrome. Um, some of those actually didn't get approved for the treatment of Tourette's um, because they didn't help everybody, but they helped some people. So 
Um, tetrabenazine has a pretty restricted use. The newer versions um, are even more restricted. And so at this point, I don't have any data to suggest that any of them would work, but it's something I think that it, it just points out there are options of things that will be important to think about in the future and that will, as a community, think about how we would use safely and how we might test. So again, next steps are kind of continuing what we're doing. Um, I think the key thing is getting more data, really getting these moved to, um, you know, in the future to our movement disorders friends to really help work on the naming side of things. Um, again, making a library that we can use as a tool for education of clinicians and those involved in clinical trials, I think is gonna be hugely important. Of course, along the way, I want to try to find medicines that work because that's what we do. We try to treat things and I don't like it any more than you do when we don't have a good treatment option. So, um, and I like to work with drugs that are already in existence because I can get them to you faster. Um, we just have to figure out what those are and how to move them to you in the safest manner possible. Um, while we're working on that, continue being really aggressive with finding treatments for constipation, because I think that is also going to help. Um, and then for women with myoclonus, uh, again, I don't have enough data to say this is definitively going to fix things, but um, I think one could argue there are additional benefits. And, and again, there's risks, That's, there's always benefits and risks to everything. Um, of use of, of oral contraceptives and modulating hormones um, to help with some of the, you know, the abnormal movements or even seizures. So, all right. Amanda, that's all the organized things I wanted to say. So I will stop sharing if that is okay. Yes, um, thank you so much. There's a lot of information to take in. And I know that um, these things take time. And I know as a parent, um, I'd like for everything to move much quicker so we can find answers for the things that um, our individuals with Angelman syndrome are struggling with. But I appreciate um, all the work that you're doing. And it sounds like you still need, you know, still need some, um, some data to collect. So uh, I guess uh, I'll get to some of the questions here in a minute and, and make sure you ask your questions in the, in the Q&A box. But if someone is interested in sending videos or doing, you know, participating in any way, uh, what would be their next step? Should they just reach out to you or? Yeah, to me, um, again, I think, or to you, I think you have the link. Yeah. I, I don't have enough form I can pull up and, and put in the, the chat. I'd have to dig around, but. Yeah, I'll um, do it. Yeah. There's definitely, you know, it's still floating around the access to, you know, completing the survey, um, attaching videos that go along with it. And, and my information is always available. So if there are challenges with any of that and figuring out how to get things uploaded, I'm happy to help and um, try to make things as user friendly as possible. Um, you know, I realized along the way, sometimes things don't necessarily always translate in my head to um, as nicely onto paper or into a survey as I would like, but. Right. Well, so a, a couple of things that I wanted to ask you um, that, that kind of stuck out to me during this conversation is, um, you know, one of the things that I'm always perplexed by or um, the things that I think I struggle from, from a lot of the, the conversations I have with parents and then just being a parent, being a parent myself you know, one of the slides you showed earlier was all the meds that this family had tried, you know, as far as treating the, um, the, either the movements or seizures or whatever it may be, how much, I mean, from your perspective as a neurologist, how much does meds like multiple meds play a role in all of this? Because I, I think it, it's a, a very frustrating for families to have to keep trying different cocktails of meds on our kids, like to get to a, to, to a sweet spot. So with some of these, I guess the question I'm asking with some of these, with um, uh, some of these tremors, shakings, movements, can some of it just be that they're just not on the right cocktail of medications? So um, 
not so easy of a question to answer. Yeah. I think right? you know this is one of the challenges where you know, uh, and this is a discussion we have every day when we talk to somebody in clinic. Yeah. And I'll often say, let's, what's the, you know, if we make the top three list to narrow down what our approach is going to be, because what is the biggest challenge today? Is it constipation? Is it communication? Is it gait? Is it seizures? Yeah. Is it non-epileptic myoclonus? And yeah. or is it behavior? And um, so then thinking about how to break that down. And if we do need to break out medicines, can we find one that helps for everything? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think looking in the chat, you know, yeah. an example of somebody who responded nicely to a low dose of clonazepam. Yeah. Um, and we definitely are big fans of clonazepam. And in some people, it works very well. Um, in others, not so much. Yeah. But you know, clonazepam is a medicine that can help people get to sleep. It can help with seizures. It can help with myoclonus. It can help with anxiety. Um, so obviously that's our goal is if we can have one treatment that helps everything, that would be ideal. Yeah. Or if that's not an option, trying to find one medicine that might do two things, yeah. which is still better than, you know, if we can use one medicine for two things, that's better than two medicines for one thing. Right. Um, yeah. But it is a lot of trial and error. Um, and it, you know, it can be a process because we can't always move too quickly because that causes side effects. Mm -hmm. Um, and while we use our experience to predict, you know, in my experience, this medicine will work. We've all had those experiences where if you or I take, um, Benadryl, we may go to sleep. And some kids, you get better. Not me. Like, I go crazy. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's like you've given someone crack and things yeah. go off the rails. <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, so we can't always easily predict which direction things are going to go. Um, right. I think that's where there's something you said for the approach of, um, you know, we try something, either push it up until it fixes the symptoms or causes side effects, and then we either go to something else and wean off the first thing or try things in combination. Yeah. I think that's such a, that's such a hard thing because, you know, uh, trying all these different medications and weaning them off, weaning them, you know, and giving it time can be definitely be a struggle. So the other question I had around just, um, drugs period, like, uh, you, you talked a lot about repurposing some of these possible drugs. So, I guess from, from next steps for this study and for this population, what does that look like for, for, from your, like you as a clinician, is it something that as a community we need to bring together to create a mini trial to try some of these medications to see if it will, if these medications could be an answer, you know, cause they could be prescribed to anyone, right? If they're already out there. So what would be the next step to like looking at some of these medications to see if they would be a, a good option for families? So uh, I think one, um, I of course still want to collect more data as much as possible. Um, simply because just like with examples, um, there may be medicines on the list that, or, you know, medicines beyond what I had on the checkbox list that somebody can say, well, hey, we use this and it was helpful. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, there's a, a drug called paracetam, which has been used in Europe for years and isn't available in the US and could be helpful. Obviously that doesn't do us a whole lot of good. No. <laughs> you know, we have an uncle in France or something, but um, I think the next approach is then as some of us as clinicians or you know, working with others that, are, you know, for example, my movement disorders friends who use a medicine like tetrabenazine all the time, you know, that's where I would work with them and say, hey, I, you know, kind of what we call an N of one trial, which is yeah. patient centered. It's me with an individual patient and a family and say, hey, this is really, de uh, really debilitating. Mm -hmm. We've tried all these other things and they don't work. Here's a medication that could cause this, 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 this side effect but it may help. Yeah. I don't have data to suggest it will help at this time, but it's reasonable to try. And if it does, then we've made things better for your child. And that may also suggest we should think about using it in someone else 
And depending on that, if it's an old drug that nobody is going to fund a bigger trial in, we just talk about how to safely use it. Yeah. If it's a newer drug, then there's options to work with pharmaceutical companies to say, hey, are you willing to help support a definitive trial? Yeah. So. And I mean, and that's hopefully hopefully part of what we're doing with you, right, is to, is, is to get to that point to where we might find some treatments that will be beneficial. And it may mean that we have to do go down that pathway. Correct. Yeah. Right. So um, what, one more question just that came up, and then I'll get to our questions. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm going to ask you, and then Win Han is on as well, so I may put him on the spot too. But knowing that we have, you know, some of these um, things in clinical, you know, some clinical trials happening right now, um, you know, obviously the, the trial um, ages right now are younger, but if and when any of these treatments cross the finish line, do we think any of these, these current treatments may help support some of this, these things happening with our, 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 our individuals with Angelman syndrome as well, either, whether it's NEM movement disorders or whatever, like, do we see that that could be a possibility? Um, sure. I, I think at this point, we just don't know. Yeah. Um, but definitely as we're, we're learning more and we have data that suggests more of these therapies are helpful and they're safe, then for sure, I would see no reason that, well, I would say we should try. Yeah. And that's, that's going to, what's going to answer the question. Um, but, you know, so yes, down the road, for sure, that should be something that should, in my opinion, should be part of the armamentarium. Um, and of course, in the meantime, we keep looking for other options. Okay. I, I think my take on that, um, is it really comes down to the etiology, the cause of these uh, abnormal movements. If, and I think we do not really know the answer to that right now, but if these abnormal movements are indeed due to loss of UBE3A itself, mm -hmm. as opposed to the surrounding genes, uh, in the case of those with the deletion, then I imagine that it would help. Uh, but if it is due to other downstream effects, if it is due to other genes around UB3A, then it's less likely. I think mm. the fact that we do see non-epileptic myoclonus, even in the UB3A um, kids with a UB3A mutation, suggests to me that it probably is at least partially, if not completely, due to loss of UB3A. But I think we will not know this until the trials are complete. Right. Well, that, that's a good perspective. Just, you know, just curious of like if that could be, you know, part of what we may see be, be beneficial of these treatments. Thank you, Wenhai. I appreciate you jumping on. I put you on the spot. So I'll, I'll get to some, I know we only have a short period of time. I'll get to some of these questions. Um, let's, I'll start from the bottom here. So the, one of the questions that came up was, does myoclonus and dystonia last continuously for 48 hours? Um, this person's son has episodes where he can't eat, drink, sleep, or urinate for more than 24 hours. And the episode finally stopped when he had a seizure. So yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I don't know what the longest time re recorded has been, but um, often, you know, all day longer. Um, I, I think, a, you know, the definitive treatment for movement disorders is sleep. So this can get you in another circular thing. Of course, Angelman kids often have trouble sleeping, but if they're also having the shaking that is preventing them from getting to sleep. Right. Um, that's where I often wonder, you know, to what extent of say you give somebody Ativan or Valium, is the drug itself helpful or is it that it really helps sedate somebody and gets them to sleep and that's the definitive way to stop it? Yeah. Um, hmm. We've, this is actually a new, and this, you bring out, this question brings up a really interesting point is there's been a, a few discussions we've had about um, individuals who have had what's very classically non-epileptic myoclonus, but then it turns into a clear epileptic seizure. Um, actually, one of the videos that has been submitted to me demonstrates that exactly. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, that maybe confounds the question a little, but, um, and then why would the seizure help abort it? I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. So one of the, someone just, just made the comment of like, um, so 
you you had mentioned that 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 these can stop while you're sleeping. This one mentioned that the, her their daughter still has them while they're sleeping. I'm I'm guessing that's possible. Yes, and so that also brings up this the added confusion of um, along you know with non-epileptic myoclonus and seizures, you can have the epileptic myoclonus, which is more on the seizure epilepsy spectrum. Mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily something that goes away with sleep. Mm. Now, um, and I think, you know, addressing kind of an earlier, uh, one of the earlier questions, we all have myoclonic twitching when we sleep. It's, most of us are asleep, so we don't know we did it. Um, so I, in general, with isolated twitches during sleep, even in someone with a myoclonic epilepsy, I don't get too worried about isolated twitches during sleep. Um, you know, if they're continuous and more like a myoclonic seizure, um, uh, you know, I kind of move that into a different category. Um, so I think that's sometimes we're getting kind of into the details of what's actually happening and what they look like. Well, I think that's the importance of the study, right? That if we can classify some of this, then it will be easier to uh, diagnose or to label and then to hopefully treat, right? Because I think that's the I, I get videos um, that families send me all the time and say, is this, you know, is this NEM? Is this seizures? And it's, it's, I'm not, first of all, I'm never will be a neurologist because I don't have the brain for it, but it's so hard to tell sometimes, right? I mean, Jackson, when he's really, really tired at night, will, will tremor as he's just sitting there, right? He'll shake a little bit because he's, you know, super tired. And so trying to figure that all out and figure out what's what I think is really a complicated, I'm, I'm guessing some of our families who have been around the block for a long time and have worked through a lot of this probably know much better than myself and probably some of clinicians out there on what these are or what they look like. But I think being able to really say this is definitively what we think this is and treat it, I think will be really important. Well, and, and I think I, I remember being in a discussion about a clinical trial and, um, you know, there's, there's lots of discussion of all the different seizure types, but non-epileptic myoclonus wasn't even on the radar. Mm -hmm. So I, I think both identifying that this is an important problem um, and then helping better classify all these different movements is, is going to be really important, especially in future drug development. Yeah. So one of the other questions is, um, I mean, can you give any sort of overview of to telling the difference between uh, myoclonic episode and a seizure? Um, so with, I think the, the myoclonus, um, again, well, and this is the thing, if I showed you the slide again of what, you know, what abnormal movements during a seizure and myoclonus is the same, but with the non-epileptic myoclonus, people can be shaking all over, yet you could have a conversation where, you know, they're, they're shaking all over, yet they'll turn and look at mom or yeah. respond to something in the environment, where in general, a epileptic seizure that involves both sides of the body is virtually always associated with loss of awareness. Okay. So now, as some of the myoclonus goes on for a long time, People can, whether they get tired or it just worsens, that there can be some, you know, decreased awareness. Um, so it, I think the level of awareness, I think, would be the, the thing that I would help differentiate the most. Um, but other times it can really can be truly challenging. Mm -hmm. And um, I've talked to families of patients who, and they have EEG data in their physician say, this is epileptic myoclonus. Yeah. I see the video and I'm like, that looks, you know, uh, just from the video and not having the rest of the data, I question if it's something else, but, um, and that's not besmirching the other epileptologists. They're, they're the ones that have the data. Right. So sometimes it's really hard. And the definitive way to answer the question is to have a, an EEG and have a trained epileptologist say, yes, there is no brain cortical EEG activity with this. It is non-epileptic. Mm. Okay. So um, this one is a long question, but I think it's an important. Um, so her son gets random falls when he starts to tremor. He will go often um, 
he will often go down like a tree. He almost freezes up and feels the tremors coming on. Sometimes he can grab something to brace himself. Other times he goes forward or backwards. Very scary. Cannot find anything control these random drops. He's fully aware when it happens. And after he falls, he shakes for 30 seconds. Then he's back up. Is this common for other patients in AS? Um, so that gets into an, an interesting, I feel like there's an intermediate zone um, where in between, so some people have tremors. So it's kind of almost like that continuous tremulousness. And then there's the myoclonus, which is kind of the really more severe whole body kind of shaking. But it does seem like a lot of patients, even standing up is a trigger and people will start tremoring. Mm. And so is this somewhere in between a tremor and myoclonus? Um, but definitely this is something that happens to others. And that's where, again, I'm still thinking hard about how to approach the tremor side of things versus the myoclonus of, um, you know, there's medicines we more commonly use to treat tremor, um, especially kind of in the epilepsy world that might help in that intermediate kind of what you're describing. Yeah. Um, but again, this is a great example of, of why it's problematic. Like, yeah, it maybe only lasts 30 seconds, but if it results in a fall, this is a problem. Yeah, I, I mean, just reading that, and once again, um, I'll get to the next question, but I think this, you know, the reason why this, is, this work is so important to the ASF is I hear stories like this quite often, and I hear, like, I see videos so often, and it's, it's heartbreaking to watch our individuals with Angelman syndrome deal with this, and it's heartbreaking for parents to not know what to do or to have answers or understand how to heck to treat it, right? I mean, I, I, I'm not at that stage yet because Jackson's seven and we haven't had to deal with that, but I feel like a lot of our older individuals with Angelman syndrome suffer with this greatly. Um, and so, um, I think this is one of the, this is one of the statements that we hear all the time and, and trying to find answers. And I, I hope everyone who's on knows that I, that ASF is committed. And I know that Dr. Carson and the rest of the clinical network is committed to figuring this out because it seems like such a decrease in quality of life, these things, right? Like I, I see, I hear people who aren't, uh, aren't walking anymore, who are, not able to feed themselves anymore. And like the quality of life for them and for their caregivers is, is uh, it's hard. Like I can't even imagine. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, to acknowledge that for people who are on the, the call that we're not gonna, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna keep working on this for as, as long as we can. Um, and, and so part, one of the other questions that came up was, you know, is it dangerous for Angelman syndrome adults to have untreated NEM? Um, uh, should ever at any point emergent care be considered? So um, I'll go politician on you, not actually yeah. answer the question, but come at it the other side. Um, this is really actually another huge challenge because for our kids who are not at home and maybe are at school or at, you know, an, an adult care, you know, doing activities, you have well-meaning caretakers who are like, oh my God, they're having a seizure. And mm -hmm. so how do we, the challenge is how do we educate everyone to say, okay, this isn't tech, you know, this isn't an epileptic seizure. And then, and because it lasts a long time, many times, how do we treat that? And at what point, and that's the hard part, what point do you call 911? Yeah. Um, because, uh, and, I honestly, you know, um, I am not aware of any evidence that would say this is dangerous. That being said, you know, when you see somebody that's been shaking for an hour, that looks pale or they're red, they're sweating, um, you know, it's clearly not comfortable. Um, obviously, you guys know more than me, it's not fun to watch. Um, and the, the corollary is the hard part of well-meaning practitioners may say, 
oh my God, this is epilepsy and we're going to pound them with all of the medicines we use to treat epilepsy. Yeah. And, you know, the hope would be they just at least give something sedating that helps them get to sleep and then it stops. But um, so uh, I think for the question about seeking emergent care, um, again, I don't think there's an easy answer. And really, I defer to you as parents as the boots on the ground. Um, you guys know your children and I think a lot of times we'll know, okay, this is different. Something is wrong. This is the time we need to seek more help. I think the challenge is though, you, you kind of said it is that, you know, if we know this is what it is and we seek, we want to seek emergency care, how many people out there know how to even treat it, right? Or what to even do when, when you go to the ER? I mean, that's the concern, right? And going to the ER is such a stress for, for you as a caregiver and at, for the individual with Angelman syndrome. And so that's the frustrating thing too, right? Like you, you want to get, you feel like they need help, but then if there's not a clear definition or a clear a standard of care on how to treat that, right? Then, you know, what can they do? Yeah, a again, it just, it reinforces the need to one, let's figure out something to make yeah. it go away. Yeah. And let's figure out if we can't figure out options to always make it go away, what are additional options we can find to help treat it to shorten the length of the spell, shorten the severity, and make each individual spell go away. Absolutely. So I know I know we're way over time and I'm 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 sorry to uh, to keep you, um, but I I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I know that some people on the call to, tonight may be disappointed that we didn't have more like a concrete, this is what it is. This is how we're gonna treat it moving forward. But I felt it was really important for us to give an update on the work that is is happening and that there is movement moving ahead on, on trying to figure out the best way that we can we can treat this, uh, this, this different thing that happens with our individuals with Angelman syndrome. And I would encourage you all that if you have a specific case that is really challenging, um, Dr. Carson's probably gonna kill me for saying this, but if you, want to, if you want to go to the Vanderbilt Clinic and have him work one-on-one -on -one with you, um, I will make sure to send out his information to everyone so that you have that information to get into the clinic. And keep in mind the ASF will help you get there. If you financially need support to get there, whatever it may be, we will help you get there to, to start maybe coming up with a plan on how we can, uh, we can support you. Dr. Carson has been incredibly wonderful for this process. I know parents have called him and he's, I've even seen him answer some questions on Facebook, which I don't typically see clinicians on Facebook. So I was pleasantly surprised at one point that he was helping out with that, but I know that he would be more than willing to, to support uh, the community. And I probably just um, upped your workload by the way. Well, I, I will say, um, obviously, I think probably everyone on this call is aware of Shaking Angels on Facebook, mm -hmm. and I, I tend to troll in the background. I'm not much of a, a Facebook poster, but um, I think it is worth stating. I think part of my goals would be to um, make that Facebook group not exist. I think a lot so, of people would love that. Um, so, and I wish more than anyone, I had the magic bullet and I could come on here and say, we need to start all of you on this and it's going to fix everything. Um, we're not there yet. You know, the, the, and just to bring some, at least a, some um, positive to this, it was really positive to see some of the posts of the families that are trying some different medications and they've said, this has been unbelievable for my child. And so I think that is something that we can at least hang our hats on tonight, knowing that, you know, there, there are, there are different things being looked at and different families taking, um, the risk to try it, um, and see how it goes. And we're really, it's like they're doing their own little mini clinical trial. So we're so appreciative of, of that that effort. But um, like I said, Dr. Carson, um, I could keep you on forever. But if anyone else has any other questions that didn't get answered tonight, please feel free to reach out to us at info at We will make sure to get those questions answered. 
we will have Dr. Carson back, um, at, you know, as this as the study progresses and we move forward and have more answers for you. But um, we hope you at least enjoy getting some updates tonight. And Dr. Carson, thank you for being on. Win Han, thank you for being on as well. And we will um, see you guys soon. And we hope you have a good evening. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Amanda. Good right. night. Thank you. Good night.